Science! Welcome to part three of the Spooky Science series. This is all about ghosts. Ghosts and the idea of ghosts have been around since ancient times. The idea of ancestor worship or honoring the dead or just that feeling of literally missing someone who has passed on and wanting to contact them again. Do you believe in ghosts? because they are the most widely accepted paranormal phenomenon and have even spawned their own literary genre, ghost stories. And I'm sure we all have one of those, either one that happened to someone we know or a ghost story that actually happened to you. The scientific community sure doesn't believe though, citing the lack of evidence and proof to warrant that ghosts are real. Science does have a few ideas about what ghosts and apparitions could actually be. One of the biggest problems science has is the actual definition of what a ghost is. Are they full-bodied, human-like, ghostly forms, or just energies that can interact with the physical world? There are so many contradictions about ghosts. Either they can move through solid objects without disturbing them, or they can slam doors shut and throw objects across the room like a poltergeist. Why do they appear clothed and with inanimate objects like hats, canes and dresses, not to mention the many reports of ghost trains, ghost ships, or ghost cars. The limits of our own perception and just ordinary physical occurrences can account for some ghost sightings. Things like air pressure, temperature, and humidity changes could actually account for slamming doors and creaking floorboards. Pareidolia is a human tendency to recognize patterns in random things, and skeptics also consider that to be an explanation for seeing ghosts. This tendency has been a part of human history for some time, even being referenced in Shakespeare's play Hamlet, when Hamlet describes a cloud that looks like a camel. Hamlet had quite a few ghosts in that play as well. Pareidolia can cause people to interpret random images or patterns of light and shadow as faces. A stick figure face, despite its simplicity, can convey mood and information and be drawn to indicate emotions such as happiness or anger. Is this why so many of us have seen a face or full figure in the darkness of a room for it only to be a coat rack or a lamp? This also lends to the idea of the power of suggestion. You believe there is a ghost because someone said there was one there. In 1813, the physician John Ferrier wrote an essay towards a theory of apparitions. In it, he argued that ghost sightings were the product of optical illusions, and for Ferrier, apparitions could be explained by what he termed a renewal of external impressions, through which a visual memory could be reanimated via the visual sense, a sort of waking dreams composed of the shreds and patches of past sensations. According to research in the field of anomalistic physiology, or the study of human behavior in connection to the paranormal, ghost sightings could be attributed to hypnagogic hallucinations, or the stuff you see in between sleep and being awake. In fact, people who experience sleep paralysis speak of seeing ghosts or being held down by spirits, which could be attributed to neurological phenomena like mirror neurons. A mirror neuron is a neuron that fires both when someone acts and when someone observes the same action being performed by another. Thus, the brainwave mirrors the behavior of the other as though the observer were itself acting. This could also account for feeling a presence a touch of the hand or your back, as you recall observing this action and manifest seeing or feeling it happen. In the last century, the widespread emergence of high-powered electronics is everywhere across the globe, from the phone in your pocket to the appliances in your home or your car. The added electrical fields could be a factor, with some scientists proclaiming that those and Earth's magnetic field can cause hallucinations and neurological symptoms. A Canadian neuroscientist named Michael Persinger has been studying the effects of electromagnetic fields on people's perceptions of ghosts for years. His hypothesis is that pulsed magnetic fields can make people feel as if there's a presence in the room with them by causing unusual activity patterns in the brain's temporal lobes. 
Also, because of the way the solar wind interacts with the Earth's magnetosphere, the planet's magnetic field stretches out on the side that's in darkness. Some researchers hypothesize that this expanded field interacts more strongly with people's brains. Mold growing in rundown, haunted sites, low frequency sounds emitted from machinery, and even carbon monoxide poisoning have been considered factors for hauntings. In fact, in 1921, Dr. W. H. Wilmer published a report of a family that moved into an old house and began experiencing weird phenomena like being held down by ghosts and a constant invisible presence. The actual reason was a faulty furnace, filling their house with carbon monoxide, and the family had oral and visual hallucinations from the poison. The furnace was fixed, and so was the family. But to believers, Ghosts are very real, and the explanations for why also vary. I personally like the one that's very eerily scientific and based upon Albert Einstein's first law of thermodynamics. If energy cannot be created or destroyed, but only change form, what happens to our body's energy when we die? Could that energy be somehow manifested as a ghost? People have been trying to contact the spirit world and commune with the dead for ages. The practice of leaving an offering for dead loved ones to communicate with the dead has been around since ancient Egypt. The three most widely known ways of hoping to communicate with ghosts are the Ouija board, the seance, and the exorcism. The oldest is most likely the Ouija board, which uses a planchette and can allow a ghost or spirit to interact with the talking board directly. One of the first mentions of the automatic writing method, or the psychic ability to produce words without thinking about them, is found in China around 1100 AD in historical documents of the Song Dynasty. Elijah Bond decided to patent the planchette along with a talking board in 1891, selling the Ouija board to immediate success. You've played with one, right? You ask a question, place your hands gently on the planchette, and then it just starts to move? The Ouija phenomena is considered by the scientific community to be the result of the ideomotor response. This is the psychological phenomena where someone makes movements involuntary. Small muscle movements can lead to large effects, and planchettes, in particular, are well suited for their task. Many used to be constructed of a lightweight wooden board and fitted with small casters to help them move more smoothly and freely. Now they're usually plastic and have felt feet, which also help it slide over the board easily. In the time of Victorian England, it was considered highly fashionable for wealthy ladies to hold a seance and serve tea to their friends. The popularity of seances increased during the 19th century with the founding of the religion of spiritualism. The traditional seance you are picturing, with a spiritualist or medium attempting to communicate with the spirits in a circle of people, was done with various tools like candles, talking boards like the Ouija board, and even spirit cabinets where the medium or psychic would be bound and placed inside, a diversion tactic much like the magic boxes of modern day stage magicians. And speaking of magicians, Harry Houdini himself investigated many so-called mediums of the time and exposed them of fraud. Houdini testified against them in front of Congress, saying, please understand that emphatically I am not attacking a religion. I respect every genuine believer in spiritualism or any other religion, but this thing they call spiritualism, wherein a medium intercommunicates with the dead, is a fraud from start to finish. In 35 years, I have never seen one genuine medium. Houdini, for even being a skeptic, did believe that ghosts and the afterlife could be real. He told his wife that when he died, if he could find a way back to contact her, he would do so in a secret code that only they knew. This apparently happened one year after his death, but many believe it to be a hoax. Mediums, psychics, and fortune tellers all claim to be able to commune with the spirit world and retrieve the answers to questions they ask. There have been many accounts of seemingly unreal coincidence in prediction and even manifestations of tables moving, bells ringing, and a ghostly presence being summoned. 
Is it all smoke and mirrors and stage magic? Or is there something real? One of the most famous seance in history that defies explanation is the basis for the movie The Conjuring. In 1971, Andrea Perone and her family moved to a house in Harrisville, Rhode Island. They soon discovered the house was filled with spirits who hadn't yet passed on, and unexplained phenomena kept happening. Scared for their lives, the Perone family called upon Ed and Lorraine Warren for help. More on them later. With them was a medium who promised to try and help the family get the spirits out. She performed a seance, and it went dreadfully wrong. The medium summoned a spirit that attacked Andrea's mother, Carolyn, and as portrayed in the movie, threw her around the house with such force she sustained a concussion. While the seance was the last severe supernatural event the family ever experienced, it left a lasting impression and a warning not to play around with the spirit world. Exorcism, or the ritual to expel demons or spirits from a person or area, has been around for a very long time, and different practices are attributed to almost every modern religion. Thanks to author and filmmaker William Peter Blatty, exorcism is widely understood because of the popular culture surrounding the film, The Exorcist. Science takes a pretty hard stance on this. Demonic possession is not a psychiatric or medical diagnosis, and the illusion that exorcism works on people experiencing symptoms of possession is attributed by some to the placebo effect and the power of suggestion. Mademoiselle Elizabeth de Renfang, who was a widow in 1617, was later sought in marriage by a physician. After being rejected, he gave her potions to make her love him, which led to strange developments in her health. Coincidentally, that physician was later burned at the stake under a judicial sentence for being found a practicing magician. Doctors couldn't cure Elizabeth and began to exorcise her in September of 1619. During the exorcisms, the demon that possessed her made detailed and fluid responses in varying languages, including French, Greek, Latin, Hebrew, and Italian, and was reportedly able to know and recite the thoughts and sins of various individuals who examined her. She was further also able to describe in detail with the use of various languages the rites and secrets of the church to experts in the languages she spoke. There was even a mention of how the demon interrupted an exorcist, who, after making a mistake in his recital of an exorcism rite in Latin, corrected his speech and then mocked him. The most that science actually has to do with ghosts and hauntings is in the investigation of them. In 1862, the Ghost Club was formed to do just that, and Charles Dickens and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle were original members. You could consider them the first Ghostbusters. Speaking of Ghostbusters, that successful 1984 comedy actually had a big hand in popularizing the paranormal and supernatural again, and led to the insurgence of ghost hunting and investigation groups. Paranormal investigators use a bunch of different tools to detect and try to capture evidence of spirits, and some tools have more to do with science than others. Since the insurgence of TV shows like Ghost Hunters, a lot of these tools and equipment have become more widely known. The ghost detecting equipment is born from malfunctioning electronics, basically. In 1861, William H. Mumler was studying photography and developed a plate with the shadowy figure of a young girl. While he knew this to be just a malfunction, he declared it to be a wonderful phenomena that needed further investigation, and started selling $10 photos, a normal sitting only cost 25 cents at the time, with the hope that a ghost would manifest in your picture. Electronic voice phenomena, or EVP, is the most widely sought after piece of evidence of ghosts, and the most refuted among scientists. Ghost hunters will take digital voice recorders and record areas that are said to be haunted. Then they will pour over the static in silence for any sign of the spirit world. Also, still photography and video is very important, which can be digital, night vision, or infrared. Many times, these cameras are hooked into a different system as to get maximum evidence. A camera might be rigged to a motion sensor or temperature gauge so that it goes off when it's agitated. 
EMF detectors are a scientific tool that measures electromagnetic radiation in homes and offices. This is usually caused by older faulty appliances or cell phones. EMF detectors are actually the main tool in a skeptic's arsenal to debunk a haunting people do not realize that there is a higher concentration of electromagnetic energy which could affect neurological processes and cause hallucinations and result in ghost sightings. This is also the favorite among the ghost hunting TV shows, which is funny because EMF detectors would be really good at picking up TV cameras and TV equipment. The ghost box is a general term for a gadget that is used to verbally communicate with spirits. The idea is that the spirit can use the white noise to communicate in some way, and this device will translate it into English. This technology has become so widespread that there are multiple versions of this as an app you can download to your smartphone. The final tool is the ghost hunting expert. Utilizing a medium, a clairvoyant, or a demonologist to add more credibility to the evidence once it is discovered. The real life Ed and Lorraine Warren, who investigated the Perone family portrayed in The Conjuring, investigated over 10,000 cases in their career, the most famous being the Amityville Horror Haunting. That real story goes back to 1974 when Ronald DeFeo Jr. shot and killed his six family members in a large Dutch colonial house in Amityville on Long Island, New York. The next year, in 1975, George and Kathy Lutz and their three children moved into the house and were terrorized by paranormal activity. Some of the things they experienced included George waking up to doors slamming. Kathy would wake up with red welts on her chest and was once levitated two feet in the air. They found a boarded up small room, painted red, that they deemed the red room, and the family dog, Harry, was absolutely terrified of it. The youngest daughter, Missy, developed an imaginary friend, Jody, who is a demonic pig creature with glowing red eyes. The family moved out after living in the house for only 28 days. This was investigated, and the only evidence that was ever recorded, other than the testimonies of the family, was the famous Demon Boy photo, taken by the Warrens and the TV crew in tow. Is this a photo of the young John DeFeo, who was brutally murdered by his father? Or was it just a trick of the camera? And it depicts one of the investigators being accidentally photographed, his eyes glowing because of the infrared camera. There are two possible reasons why ghost hunters have yet to find good, plausible evidence. The first is, is that ghosts just don't exist, and all ghost sightings can be explained by psychology, misconception, mistakes, and even hoaxes. The other option, is that ghosts do exist, and we just don't have the scientific knowledge and technology to detect them yet. Do we believe our eyes when something we can't explain moves in the dark, or do we just chalk it up to our mind playing tricks on us again? I personally like to go back to that Einstein explanation, because energy is everywhere. And what if, when we die, a part of us remains, and sometimes others can contact the remnants of who we once were?